What is up, wrestling fans? Welcome to another episode of the Smart Out Moment Smack Talk Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Tony Mango, and as you can tell by the title here, this is Fantasy Booking. So if you are unfamiliar with what fantasy booking is, let me give you a quick little rundown here of how this is going to work. Essentially, this is where I rewrite the card for a particular show. I usually do this for WrestleMania and for SummerSlam, sometimes throughout the year, maybe one of them for Money in the Bank or something like that, but it's usually those two big pay-per-views of the year. And one of the reasons why is because they're good anchor points, and you need an anchor for how you're going to do this, because if you don't actually have a time frame of where you would like to go back to, then it's hard to kind of figure out how much you can rewrite. Well, this is kind of a fan fiction kind of uh, how I think I would be doing things if I were in WWE's shoes and sort of mixing the two together a little bit. Uh, before we get into the card itself for WrestleMania 34 that I would be doing, I want to set up a couple ground rules. First things first, we have to talk about that time framing issue, and I think that the simplest way to do things is always that you can only go back as far as the previous WrestleMania, the night after WrestleMania. You can't change with the way that last year's WrestleMania went down, because that was already in the plans, that was already what they were building to, and you can't just go, well, you know, last year, WrestleMania 33, I decided that at the last second, right before the event, everything would change, and these would be the matches. And then I would go for here, and whatever like that. No. You have to start from Brock Lesnar beats Goldberg for the Universal Championship, The Undertaker loses to Roman Reigns, so on and so forth when it comes to all that stuff. You can do any changes from that point onward as long as the second qualification, they must be somewhat realistic. You have to take in mind, for instance, something like the Goldberg and Brock Lesnar thing. Goldberg was going into that with the mindset of that being his last match. So you can't go, well, and then Goldberg loses a bunch of weight and he starts competing for 205 Live and he wrestles twice a week and whatever. No, that's not going to happen. So you have to keep it somewhat realistic. Kind of uh, justified as well when it comes to what WWE would want to do, because if this is something that you are in control of, but you're not the only person that is in control here, because WWE isn't a one-person deal. Vince McMahon has the cre uh, creative control to be able to shoot down ideas, but he still has other people on the creative team, and he still has other people saying, I don't know if that's a good idea, and such. So, so keep that in mind as well. Uh, you also have to keep in mind when it comes to the realistic kind of things, you can't bring back dead wrestlers or, you know, like, for instance, something like uh, a retired person who can't wrestle anymore like Edge. He can't wrestle anymore, so you can't just magically wish him well and assume that he would be able to wrestle now because it's been a couple of years, it's not going to happen. Uh, nor can you bring back Andre the Giant and have him win the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. It literally is not going to happen. Another thing to keep in mind, you can't bring people from outside the company in just because you like them and just assume, well, what I would do here is I would just create this kind of uh, atmosphere where everybody who in the company uh, Rolodex could come back at any point and anybody from other companies can come in. So we're going to have Okada versus what? No, it's not going to happen. You know what I mean? You can bring back somebody who is in the fold of WWE, like, for instance, somebody like a Rey Mysterio who popped back up, or Hurricane Helms, clearly they worked within the system, so you can push Hurricane Helms to be the Cruiserweight Champion or something like that if you wanted to. It's all relative, and you gotta use your best judgment. Same thing when it comes to the NXT call-ups, WWE never brings up, like, 50 people, <laughs> so, you know, bring up five people, bring up 10 people, maybe, but don't bring up the entire NXT roster and do something crazy. You cannot get rid of the brand split. That is something that they are tinkering around with a little bit right now, but they still do have the brand split, so you can't just merge them together. And you also have to take into account time, because WrestleMania is a two-hour pre-show and a four-hour normal show. 
There's a possibility that maybe they have a five-hour normal show this year that's been a little bit of like a rumbling. I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case. So I'm working with that. If you really, really, really think that you can add another hour to it and make it a seven-hour show, you have to justify it. And you can't just say every match gets 40 minutes or something like that. So you also can't say you've got 26 matches on the card and they all have 20 minutes because that doesn't end up working out. You know what I mean? So you have to keep those ground rules in mind. That's what I forced myself to do. And I also went a little bit of an extra step to a certain extent where I tried to keep some feuds the way that they were and just tinker around a little bit with some other kind of things, just tweak some things here and there. Normally, at the beginning of this, I would start off by saying I also would change the commentary teams and different things like that. But to be perfectly honest, right now with the crop of people that we have, I don't know what I would do. I don't think Corey Graves is good to be somebody on Raw and on SmackDown. So I would replace him on Raw, but I don't know who could be that other person. Jonathan Coachman and Michael Cole and blank. And then the same thing goes with Nigel McGuinness on 205 Live. I don't think Nigel's really all that great, so I would replace him. Vic Joseph is fine, just keep him. But I don't know who I would replace him with. And that kind of causes a little bit of an issue. And I sort of looked into that a little bit and kind of figured, you know what? I don't know this year. So you're missing out on that kind of a thing at the very least. But we're going to kick things off with the pre-show. And the start of this, the way that I want to do it, is a little bit simpler... I guess you could say then doing a tournament for the Cruiserweight Championship, but I like the idea of the tournament that they're doing. And I would assume that, you know, I'm taking Enzo Amore out of the mix. I'm assuming that he is fired from the company for the same type of reasons and stuff, you know, because I can't control his personal life and stuff. And maybe not even necessarily that being the case, but he is not the champion going into this, nor is the championship necessarily blank. Um, I would have a cruiserweight championship gauntlet match. So the beginning of this pre-show is essentially a showcase of the cruiserweight division where you've got multiple people. It's very, very quick. Oh, maybe, I don't know, six people are in the gauntlet match. Maybe it's 10, maybe it's 30. You know what I mean? I don't really know exactly how I would book that, but the end game would be a heel against a baby face. And I couldn't quite hundred percent decide on which I would go with, but I was leaning a little bit more towards my ideal final two would be TJP and Rey Mysterio. That's assuming of course, Rey Mysterio would be able to come back into the fold that way. If not, you can replace him with Johnny Gargano, or you could replace him with Cedric Alexander. Either way, I still like all three. And I still think all three would be really good in this position. Same thing for TJP. You could replace him with Neville. And I think that that would be a good choice too. That would be maybe the type of thing that he would stick around for. I like the idea. I think that a cruiserweight championship gauntlet is a good way to have everybody do all their flippy shit and make it very, very fast paced. And also a match that not, not necessarily everybody's going to dig, but also if they don't know of the cruiserweight division, watching the highlight reel essentially could get them to maybe go, oh, they do this stuff all the time? Well, maybe I'll tune in and watch. I think that's what you need here. So Cruiserweight Championship gauntlet match, that starts off the night very quick, very hot, just to get the people to warm up and just to be like, oh, damn, all right, we're going to be doing this. This is pretty sweet. Okay, that's the good, the good start for WrestleMania. That's how I see it. This is followed by the United States Championship match. Bobby Roode goes into this as the champion and as a heel against Randy Orton. I know that we just saw this, but remember, keep in mind, this is me rewriting WrestleMania and the road to WrestleMania 34, where we would not have actually gotten this ahead of time. This would have been a feud that they would have teased here and there, and Bobby Roode wouldn't have turned babyface to begin with. I don't think that he works as a babyface all that well, but Randy Orton would have stayed a babyface, and this would have kept that story of that whole Grand Slam champion idea, but there is no Jinder Mahal in the mix. If you recall, Jinder Mahal was a part of the United States Championship, I think, uh, scenario that I had had last year for SummerSlam or so, and I kind of picked up some of those storylines and reworked some of them too over time, but 
Uh, Mahal was somebody who I never thought should have been a WWE champion. I think he should have been a United States champion. So more than likely, what I would have done is Mahal would have won the United States championship somewhere in 2017, lost it to somebody who would have lost it to Bobby Roode. And then now in this scenario, Bobby Roode ends up cheating to retain the title against Randy Orton. And it's on the pre-show. I know that that sucks for the United States championship to be on the pre-show, but I just couldn't fit anything else on the pre-show and I didn't want to bump anything else either. And I think that him retaining the title works well for the pre-show. Uh, Randy Orton would win the title at the next event which would probably be payback or backlash, depending on, you know, pay-per-view schedules and stuff. And later on in the year, Bobby Roode would win the co-branded Money in the Bank and win his first world title in WWE. But he's a heel throughout this whole thing, and he cheats to win and retain the title at WrestleMania. The final part of the pre-show for me would be the fifth annual Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, and you'll see this throughout the card. I am not including a Fabulous Moolah Battle Royal because I do not think that that is necessary. Uh, I would put a lot of focus more on this Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal in a way that people would actually be looking forward to it. I think you need to have some pretty big names in here for it to be something that people give a shit about, so... Let's assume Dean Ambrose isn't injured. He's in there. Sami Zayn is in there. Baron Corbin, Bray Wyatt, Dolph Ziggler, Matt Hardy, Jinder Mahal. If later on there is a situation where I have a, a Shinsuke Nakamura match, if Shinsuke Nakamura is not in that match, Shinsuke Nakamura not only is in this, but he actually wins the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. If Nakamura is not in the match, then the match ends up going to Drew McIntyre. And this is really where, I mean, you can just add all the names that you want when it comes to this. Anybody who isn't on the card, they get in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. So you've got tag teams like Titus Worldwide, and you've got the Miztourage, and uh, you've got kind of all the, the lower card guys like, uh, let's say, Kurt Hawkins, and Mike Kanellis, and Mojo Rawley, and... Even the people like Ty Dillinger that I like, but I couldn't figure out a better place for him. And Kane is in this if he's able to compete. Goldust is in this. Brizongo, you know, just anybody who is in the mix when it comes to that stuff. And some NXT people as well. No Way Jose gets brought in. Drew McIntyre, as I said, he ends up winning if it's not Shinsuke Nakamura. But you really just kind of pick anybody that you want to, to get a spot on the card that doesn't have a card spot yet. And that's how you, you kind of work everybody into there and it sucks that it's on the pre-show again but it's something that kind of needs to be on the pre-show a little bit more than some of the other ones you just happen to have to give it more attention it doesn't take that much to build this up too that's the thing just have some noteworthy person go i want to win the andre the john memorial battle royal and then other people go no you're not worthy enough to win that i will win it and whatever and then people might give a shit you know what i mean Maybe even put a stipulation on this where the winner of the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal gets some kind of a title shot or something like that. I think that works. And I think that Shinsuke Nakamura or Drew McIntyre are both very good choices for that. Nakamura in the sense that he can build that towards a title shot. Drew McIntyre in the sense that he might be able to use that to springboard his momentum onto the main roster. Because I'm also assuming Drew McIntyre didn't get injured. And, you know, like, you can kind of play around with it when it comes to that stuff. If somebody's been injured before WrestleMania last year, you can't bring them back. But, you know, maybe some of these other injuries don't necessarily happen. By this point, the pre-show is done. We have gone through all of our pre-show panel analysis stuff. We've had our video packages that we're not going to see the whole rest of the night because fuck that. We don't need to waste time. And everything else is just on the show itself. And I, I sort of broke it up on the website as, like, hour one, hour two. Of course, it's going to bleed into it here and there. You're not going to have like, all right, it's uh, 7.59 and that means we're starting hour two and, you know, like that kind of thing. It's going to have some overlap and stuff, so keep that in mind. But match by match, we're going to go through here. We're going to start the show off with just a classic normal match because we have already at this point had a battle royal and a gauntlet and a normal match too, but, you know, that's one normal match out of three. So we're going to start off with The Miz defending the Intercontinental Championship against Seth Rollins. Right now, we're going to be getting that at WrestleMania, but with Finn Balor in the mix. I don't include Finn Balor for a different reason. He's coming up a little bit later on. 
Instead, this is just Seth Rollins beating The Miz. He wins the Intercontinental Championship. Rollins, I think, is like the perfect type of guy that can boost that Intercontinental title right now, and he won't necessarily be the focal point on Monday Night Raw, so it makes sense for him to be in that upper mid-card kind of scene. The Miz is another guy. I freaking love The Miz. Uh, I hate the idea that he would have to lose a match here because I'd love to give him a big, big win, but he is the type of guy that he is better when he's losing, kind of, and he would have had that whole long Intercontinental title reign, and he'd get more, too, down the line. The Miz would be the type of guy that I think he needs to beat Jericho's record, and I would even possibly maybe go with the idea of him beating the Honky Tonk Mans. Maybe. I don't know. It's something to think about. But for now, Seth Rollins beats The Miz. We start off WrestleMania with a title change and a babyface winning, and everybody's happy. It's a standard match, and we don't have to worry too much about that kind of stuff. We pick up after there with the Raw Women's Championship Triple Threat Match. That is a scenario that I thought that we were going to be getting, but we actually are not, where Alexa Bliss has been using Nia Jax to manipulate and make her protect her from Asuka, who wins the Women's Battle, uh, Women's Royal Rumble, and she gets her title shot, and she picks Alexa Bliss because she thinks that Alexa Bliss is not deserving of being a champion. Meanwhile, Charlotte Flair is the champion over on SmackDown, and they kind of just allude to the idea of, yeah, they'll collide at some point. But she, uh, uh, she meaning Asuka, doesn't think that Alexa is somebody who carries herself as an actual champion and she just cheats to win and she wants to just beat her and say, fuck it, you know, I'm better. And Nia Jax, meanwhile, is that person standing in the way of that because she always comes to Alexa Bliss's aid. But Nia realizes that Alexa Bliss is just kind of using her. It's sort of similar to what we've gotten now, but instead of Asuka just going, yeah, fuck it, I'm going to wrestle Charlotte, they continue the story. And um, I don't think Asuka versus Alexa Bliss would be any kind of a real competitive match. And I also think that Nia Jax versus Alexa Bliss wouldn't be a competitive match. So that's why there's a triple threat, because Nia versus Asuka, that is competitive. And Alexa, in the meantime, tries to get involved, and she sort of messes things up for the other two and here and there. And um, Nia kind of wants to beat Alexa but Asuka doesn't want to let her because then her streak ends and she doesn't win the championship. Asuka wants to be Alexa, but Naya is standing in the way. And you sort of have this kind of race between who can beat Alexa while Alexa is trying to run away from the two, but can't literally run away because this is, you know, no disqualification. So it ends with Asuka getting the win on Alexa Bliss. Nia Jax and Alexa are no longer friends. Nia Jax is officially starting to turn into a baby face, and they can kind of continue the Asuka Jax stuff or the Asuka Alexa stuff or the Alexa Nia thing, depending on where you would want to go in the future. But it ends with Asuka winning the Raw Women's Championship. Ronda Rousey, by the way, not a member of the Monday Night Raw roster. She's a free agent in my scenario. So keep that in mind. Going from the Raw Women's Championship to a Raw Tag Team Championship match, this is a six-man tag team match, The Bar against The Balor Club. And you might be thinking to yourself, why is The Bar in a six-man tag team match? Well, here's where the first big, big change to the card comes in. Cassius Ono from NXT joins The Bar. And he and Sheamus have a history together in uh, Ring of Honor. They were a part of the Kings of Wrestling. So that is where you build on this. Sheamus has spinal stenosis. The less that he wrestles, the better for him. If you include a third person in the bar, then he doesn't have to wrestle as much, but he still gets that blowback of the heat, and he still builds heat if he's on the ringside. Kind of stuff like, uh, like Xavier Woods in The New Day. He wrestles sometimes, he doesn't wrestle, he's still an equal part of the New Day. Uh, Sheamus and Cesaro with Cassius Ono would have this kind of reputation that they sort of have now. They're brawlers and they uh, they like fighting people and they like beating people up and all that other kind of stuff and that they set the bar and all the other kind of stuff. We are the bar, that kind of thing. But the Balor Club has something to say about that and 
Finn Balor teams up with Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows. They are the baby faces in this scenario. They win the titles. And I'd go even so far as to excommunicate Sheamus from the bar. Because I think at that point, the bar is something that he doesn't necessarily need. And he can go wrestle in a singles capacity on SmackDown after the whole superstar shakeup and stuff. Or he could just take some time off. That's another thing too. So the bar drops the titles. That means we've gotten three brand new champions in the first, you know, hour, hour and 10 minutes, something like that. Well, however long it would take, I don't know. And you need a break from that. You know, you can't just necessarily have champion uh, changes the titles, champions change, champions change, that kind of a thing over and over and over one by one by one. So you need to split it up a little bit. And by doing that, we go over to a tag team match, and this is different from what we've got going on right now. Uh, The one we were going to have for WrestleMania is going to be Triple H and Stephanie McMahon against Kurt Angle and Ronda Rousey. Well, this is Triple H and Kevin Owens against Kurt Angle and Jason Jordan. The reasoning behind this, right, Kevin Owens never goes to SmackDown, because what did he do with SmackDown? He had like 15 or 20 matches with AJ Styles. And then he started a feud with Shane McMahon because of the way that those matches were ending. And then Sami Zayn started teaming up with him. And now he's continuing to just do this Sami Zayn, Shane McMahon thing. He's really only feuded with two people. I don't think that that's good enough. So instead, Owens never goes over to SmackDown. He stays on Monday Night Raw. He stays as Triple H's go-to type of guy that he can be a stooge for. And Kurt Angle and he have some issues along the way because he kind of has that little bit of the feud with Shane McMahon, but it's more of a feud with uh, Kurt Angle. And Jason Jordan is Kurt Angle's kid. He stands up for him and Kevin Owens beats the shit out of him and different uh, things along the line like that. So it gets to a point where Triple H is like, look, don't fuck with Kevin Owens. He's my guy. And Kurt Angle goes, don't fuck with Jason Jordan. He's my kid. And we have Angle and Jordan against Triple H and Kevin Owens. I'm pretty sure what I would go with here is actually Kevin Owens and Triple H winning. And that is something that would be cheered but booed at the same time. You can't have all baby faces win. But you know what? If uh, Kurt Angle and Jason Jordan win, then sure, go for that too. Eventually down the line in 2018, Jason Jordan would turn heel on Kurt Angle, say that he faked everything, he's not actually his kid, and he just did this to get ahead. But he would do that after he would win the Intercontinental Championship. And he would win the Intercontinental Championship from Seth Rollins a little bit later on after that. So that's something to to kind of keep in mind. By now we need a break. So instead of having just a backstage promo or something like that, we're going to give a little bit of a showcase to Elias. So he comes out, he cuts his musical performance, Jeff Jarrett interrupts him, He smashes a guitar over his head. They have a little bit of a scuffle. Jeff Jarrett comes out on top. Elias is made to look like an ass. And that's, I guess, just a, I don't know, a five, six minute type of thing. It's just a bathroom break. It's just something to get people to go, ah, okay, well, now we're into, you know, a certain section of hour two and I needed to pee and, you know, different things like that. Um, That's Elias's big moment. He wrestles earlier in the night in the Under the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, and I like Elias, and I would like to give him a better spot, but I think that that is the best spot for him right now, because I don't want him winning any of those championships yet. He's still not at that level, and if he at least gets to do the thing that makes him him, and he showcases Jeff Jarrett in the mix too, then cool. I'm hoping that that is more of a Jeff Jarrett thing than a Kid Rock thing, because I do not care about Elias and Kid Rock. Elias and Jeff Jarrett, that seems more fun to me. Now that we have our little bit of a break, we go over to the SmackDown Tag Team Championship match. It is another triple threat, and this is pretty much exactly the same as what we're getting right now. I had this card, by the way. Uh, This is a card that I wrote up about, uh, what was it, three months ago or so? I, I wrote this and I barely changed anything from it. So ahead of time, I was thinking to myself, it'd be really good if we had like the Udo, the Udos, the Usos and the New Day, and the Bludgeon Brothers, and they make it all about brotherhood. You know, the Usos are biological brothers. They have done the day one-ish type shit. The day one-ish type shit. Do I really say that? The ish shit? Uh, 
they are biological. They have literally been brothers from the start because they are twins, you know, that kind of a thing. And the New Day, they consider themselves brothers. They're they're spiritual brothers. They are brothers in uh, friendship, essentially. And they kind of have that sort of argument, I guess, of like, it's one thing to be born into having a brother. It's another thing to choose your brother and to forge a relationship with somebody that they become a brother. It's a little bit of a, a soap opera when it comes to that. Bludgeon Brothers, by the way, they call themselves the Bludgeon Brothers, and they are brothers in, I guess you could say, like, the Blood Brothers, sort of, where they have that kindred spirit of something kind of like the New Day, but they also consider themselves brothers as part of the Wyatt family cult that they had been a part of before, and that they both just relish in beating the shit out of people and stuff, and... I'm leaning more towards the idea that the Usos go in as the champions because they are the biological brothers, but they lose to the New Day. Maybe the Usos retain, maybe the Bludgeon Brothers win. To be perfectly honest, I don't really know because this is going to continue after that. It's just sort of something where I would talk to the other people and go, who do you think should win this one? And then we would figure it out. But it's essentially the same match that we're getting now, which is actually kind of cool. I like that. Then we have a big one. This is totally different. And this is something that I'm sure some people are going to be like, wait a minute, what? On the table for three that Jim Cornette was on, he had suggested, why don't we have a submission match between Samoa Joe and Brock Lesnar? And as soon as he said that, I thought to myself, fuck, I want to see that. Now, we have seen Samoa Joe versus Brock Lesnar in 2017, but I wouldn't have done it. Instead, Brock Lesnar, this is going to spoil something for something later on. Brock Lesnar would have dropped the Universal Championship to Roman Reigns at SummerSlam. So we would not have needed Brock Lesnar versus Samoa Joe, Brock Lesnar versus Braun Strowman, Brock Lesnar versus uh, Braun Strowman and Kane, that kind of a thing. Brock probably would have fought Kane. He probably would have fought, uh, I don't know, here and there. Maybe he would have fought Finn Balor. Maybe he would have fought somebody else. I don't know. It's really just take your pick. He would have lost at SummerSlam, so he's not going into WrestleMania with the Universal Championship. Someone else's. And Samoa Joe, in the meanwhile, needed more of what he did this year. He didn't really get to accomplish all that much again. I would want Samoa Joe to really be one of those top guys. So I would have the Brock Lesnar title switch, and I'd put him a little bit more on a babyface side of things, where... He wouldn't necessarily be a babyface because Brock is not a babyface, but he would be a little bit less the top heel, unbeatable type guy. He would take a bunch of people down with the Kimura lock, and this would draw the ire of Samoa Joe. Joe would look at this as, you don't get to come in here and say that you are the submission guy. I'm the submission specialist. I'm the beast. I will kick your ass, and I will prove to you that I am the guy when it comes to that kind of a thing. And he wins. He beats Brock Lesnar in a submission match at WrestleMania. And people just go, oh, fuck. You got Brock to tap? And I know people are going to go, Brock would never do it. You know what? He's getting paid. If Brock does not want to do it, you don't pay Brock. That's the end of it. That guy needs to be brought down a peg because he is a big star, but he is not some, you know, five levels above everybody else. If they lose him, they lose the whole company type of guy. No, he needs to stop acting like that. So Samoa Joe wins and we get set up for the idea that Samoa Joe is the guy because Brock Lesnar could leave anytime that he does this kind of shit. And anytime that he does it and he wants to leave, well, you know what? We don't have to depend on him as much anymore. Uh, I would think that maybe like a Bobby Lashley, if he did sign with WWE, Bobby Lashley and Samoa Joe could have a big feud going forward. Bobby Lashley and Brock Lesnar could. We can kind of do a little bit of stuff when it comes to them, but this would end with Samoa Joe making Brock Lesnar tap out, which makes a big, big, big statement. And I think it's for the best. So at that point, we need another break. And the reason I say that is because we're going into hour three probably at this point, and there's probably some people that didn't necessarily take that previous break with the Elias thing, and they're sitting there going, oh my god, I really, really need another break right here. So this is our Hall of Fame recap. This is where we get Jeff Jarrett and Goldberg and 
the Dudley boys and anybody else that they wanted to bring into the hall of fame, all those people, they come out, they do their little parade. They wave to the crowd. We have a couple backstage segments, some interviews, and we just sort of keep it a little bit easy and give everybody a little bit of time to, to digest what just happened with Samoa Joe just beating Brock Lesnar. Like, Whoa, man. Okay. That's kind of crazy. And by that point, we've got it all sorted. Everybody's ready to go. We've got, you know, a couple more, uh, hours left to go and we need to get right into the next big thing because we're getting that stretch where it's just the big matches on the card just knocking things out left and right and one of those of course is the four horse women versus the four horse women ronda rousey comes into wwe and she is there with Shayna baszler who is kicking some ass in nxt and they are drawing the ire, if I want to uh, repeat that phrase again, um, against the, you know, the other four horsewomen, the four horsewomen of WWE or of NXT or whatever, Charlotte Flair, Bailey, Sasha Banks, and Becky Lynch. So you got Jessamyn Duke, you got Marina Shafir, and those are the two outliers. We don't know if they necessarily are willing to compete or what they're willing to do. So here is the difference. There are two possible options you go with here. Either you go with my preference, which would be the four horse women against the four horse women, all four against all four. It's just a, uh, an eight man or an eight man. <laughs> yeah, it's an eight man one, an eight woman tag team match and nothing is on the line or it's just, uh, you know, a, a feud or you go with Charlotte Flair holding the SmackDown women's championship and defending it against Ronda Rousey with the three others on the ringside in their corner, just to kind of, I guess you could sort of say, play the part of what the NWO and DX did on the Sting versus Triple H thing, where they weren't a part of the match, but they did come into it. They did make it part of what was fun about it and stuff. And you don't really have to rely on them to do too much. You know, Marina Shafir doesn't need to know how to wrestle. She can just brawl. Like you could do that kind of a thing. Uh, in either fashion, Charlotte Flair is the SmackDown Women's Champion. Uh, she has the title, whether or not it's on the line. And I don't know if she defends the title here, if I would have her lose. I don't think I would. I think I'd have Ronda Rousey lose. I don't know. That's tough. That's a really tough call. If it's four horse women versus four horse women, I don't know if I would really want to make all four of WWE's primary women lose. But if they do something like maybe, maybe the way that they win, or maybe the way that Ronda Rousey wins, whatever the case may be. Maybe it's Shayna Baszler, who is easily the biggest heel out of the bunch. Maybe she cheats and she does something that maybe not necessarily even Ronda Rousey and Duke and uh, Shafir want to do and costs the other side their win or something like that. It's tough to say, but I have no interest in Shane McMahon, Shane McMahon, in uh, Stephanie McMahon versus Ronda Rousey. They already did their segment a couple years ago. We already saw pretty much exactly what I'm assuming that we're going to see here. I don't think it's going to be good with this uh, Kurt Angle, Triple H mixed tag match thing. And even though I think that it, one of the main reasons why it's going to suck is I don't think that Ronda Rousey is going to be that good, which would make you go, well, why would you trust Ronda Rousey? and Duke and, you know, whatever. Uh, why would you trust them in a match on their own with without having Kurt Angle and Triple H in the mix? Well, because if they want to be a part of WWE, they need to suck it up and they need to do it. And if they suck, then they need to learn how to do it better. And if not, then, hey, it happens. We had Bret Hart versus Vince McMahon one year, and people still think that Bret Hart is great and people uh, still bow down to Vince McMahon. It wouldn't be the end of the world, and maybe it would actually get people to stop fussing as much over that because I think that the Ronda Rousey stuff makes perfect sense to promote ahead of time and to make a big deal. But I also don't want her to come in, wrestle just a couple minutes and like be, you know, considered like the, the greatest thing in the world. If she can't stand on her own, then they need to know that, you know what I mean? And she's not standing on her own here. She's got the three others, but she's the leader of the bunch. And really it's kind of, throw her into the fire and see what happens. And you have to do four, four horse women versus four horse women at some point. You just have to just do it first, you know, otherwise, what else do you do? There isn't anything else for Ronda Rousey to do. Cause I don't like this Stephanie McMahon thing. So you either do that or you have her 
I don't know, be the special guest referee of something and then whatever. And that that's just not good enough necessarily. So the winner of the match, question mark. <laughs> I need no explanation for our next thing. John Cena versus The Undertaker. If it's happening, that means that it is a potential to happen back uh, in time. And it's something that they were looking at before. And John Cena does what he does. John uh, Undertaker does what he does. There's no American badass. This is the Undertaker Undertaker. Maybe uh, maybe a little bit of a mix. I'll, I'll go with that. Maybe he is a little bit less of the mysterious uh, dead man character and a little bit more of the American badass, but he doesn't actually come out on a bike and shit. You know what I mean? I don't want to see that. But maybe he kind of comes in as like, you know, more of a man and that kind of a thing and, instead of a dead man. John Cena versus Undertaker is a match that we needed and I really wish that I could go back in time and make it to where the Undertaker is not somebody who has lost because if you put John Cena versus the Undertaker with the streak on the line people are going to care so much more but Undertaker is victorious I'm assuming that this is probably his last match and he should go out on top I like that idea really what else do I need to say about it I don't think I really need to say anything else right it's Cena and Undertaker you're going to buy the ticket so we have two more matches on the card. Uh, in the meantime, we will have had some kind of a bathroom break thing. I don't know, no, nothing to really think too much about. But our second to last match of the night is going to be the WWE Championship match. And I have two possible scenarios here. One of them is just pure fantasy, I'm assuming. And the other one is reality. Um, the pure fantasy one, I'll go with that one first. Daniel Bryan wins the Royal Rumble challenges AJ Styles, wins the championship. I don't think it's going to happen. I'm working under the assumption that WWE is not going to clear him and that if they were to clear him, they would have, uh, I think, a little while ago. And I think that you do the build up to WrestleMania that way. You have him win that Royal Rumble and you, you make it a big deal and you give him those couple of months where he can kind of get a little bit back into shape and bring back the whole yes movement and all the other kind of stuff like that. I don't know if I would really necessarily have him be the babyface or make him turn heel or keep both he and Styles babyface, turn Styles heel. I think I'd lean more towards Styles and Brian are both babyfaces here because you can do that. Um, but I don't think that it would happen. So... <laughs> You know, that's where I get into the mix where if Daniel Bryan is in this match, Shinsuke Nakamura is in the Battle Royal and he wins that. But let's assume that that's not necessarily the case. And I don't think that that's going to be. So instead, we get Shinsuke Nakamura versus AJ Styles. And it's the same type of deal as what we're getting right now. Shinsuke Nakamura wins the Royal Rumble. They spend the next couple of weeks or months building him up a little bit more than what we actually got. And it's a respect thing. Nakamura goes into it wanting to fight AJ Styles. Styles wants to fight Shinsuke Nakamura. Here's where I might deviate. I think I might have Styles retain. I don't know. That's a little tough. I don't think that Shinsuke Nakamura is ready right now to take on the top spot on SmackDown. But if we would have been able to build him up ahead of time better throughout 2017, which I would have tried to make a priority, then that might not necessarily be the case. So it all depends. If I was able to get to a point where post WrestleMania, I felt like he was ready, I would put the title on him. If not, I would just have him come up short because it's AJ Styles. People aren't going to be super pissed if Nakamura doesn't win. Styles is more popular. So it's kind of a 50-50 deal. If you could do the Daniel Bryan thing, you do that. You push Nakamura aside. If not, then what you do is the same old Nakamura stuff that we've been getting, except you put more of an investment in Nakamura to where it pays off more. And finally, our last match, our main event of the night, is the Universal Championship. Roman Reigns going in as the champion, defending against Braun Strowman. So here's the setup. Some things are the same, some things are different. The difference that I mentioned first off was Brock Lesnar drops the Universal Championship to Roman Reigns at SummerSlam, but Roman Reigns turned to heel. And I know you're thinking to yourself, WWE would never do that. They want Roman Reigns to be the babyface. I think you just have to make that judgment call and you just say to yourself, we have to do it. 
The Rock got popular after he turned babyface from turning heel. He didn't start as the babyface and get that kind of a push, and it worked. It didn't. He had to turn to a villain because he started to get that whole die, Rocky, die stuff. And you would have thought 20 years ago when they went through this that they would have learned their lesson for that. The biggest people in the company over that time span were Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock. And they both were heels that got cheered, that they turned into baby faces. So you do the same thing. Herman Reigns is the type of guy that he should be the baby face at some point in the future, but he clearly isn't right now and they can't ignore that. So you turn him, you just make him a heel. It's okay. The kids aren't going to, you know, stop watching. They've got other people that they like just as much, if not more, and they'll figure it out. And you also, in the meantime, are building up Braun Strowman. Braun Strowman has had a great 2017 as far as building up momentum, but they never want to be pulling the trigger on him. And now it seems like we're getting him winning the tag team championship, which is just kind of, I don't know why they're doing that with him. We'll see. But Strowman, all throughout 2017, there would be this dynamic switch between Roman being the top guy that turns heel and Strowman reaching that top status and becoming a baby face. And anytime that they would be about to fight each other, something would happen in the way, you know, whether it's Reigns and Strowman are about to clash and Samoa Joe gets involved or Brock Lesnar gets involved or, you know, whatever the case may be like that kind of a thing. Uh, Braun Strowman, by the time of the Royal Rumble, would be so feverishly ready to beat Roman Reigns, and the crowd would be so pumped to see it, that Reigns would screw him out of the Royal Rumble. And people would be livid at this point, because it would just be like, here you go, here's the fucking company guy, he's a heel, and we can boo him and all that, but, you know, like that kind of a thing. And he screws the guy that's more important, and, you know, that kind of a thing. But then the Elimination Chamber comes up, and Strowman goes apeshit, and he wins the Elimination Chamber, sets himself up to be the challenger for the heel Roman Reigns, and they don't have had uh, all those matches, they wouldn't have had those, so this is really like their first true confrontation, kind of. Braun Strowman wins the WWE Universal Championship to close off the WrestleMania card, and he holds it for the majority of 2018, maybe around Survivor Series, maybe a little bit before that or so, we get a scenario where the money in the bank has already been extinguished. Uh, Bobby Roode has already cashed in on either Shinsuke Nakamura or AJ Styles, depending on whichever one of those, or Daniel Bryan, depending on if he's the champion too. Uh, And it seems like Braun Strowman can't be beaten, but Remember how we set up Samoa Joe as that top dog? Samoa Joe takes out Braun Strowman. And Samoa Joe, for people that are thinking about, if I'm not thinking ahead for WrestleMania 35, Samoa Joe goes into WrestleMania with the Universal Championship to defend and unsuccessfully uh, have this match against John Cena, who wins his 17th world title at WrestleMania 35 from Samoa Joe. It is the Universal Championship, the main championship that he hasn't won yet other than the Intercontinental title. And that's your big uh, WrestleMania moment when it comes to next year. You've set up Roman as the heel to put up Braun Strowman, who puts over Samoa Joe, who puts over John Cena. And Strowman, in the meantime, he's had that uh, universal title reign, and he goes into WrestleMania 35 to fight either Brock Lesnar or somebody else who's good enough to challenge him. I'm assuming Brock Lesnar, though, and beats Brock Lesnar, because Brock Lesnar could lose. You know what I mean? Maybe he fights Triple H, though. Maybe it's Braun Strowman, Triple H. Maybe it's Braun Strowman versus, uh, I don't know. That's something to think about for next year. So that is my card for WrestleMania 34. It's not 100% exactly what I would do if I could go back in time for multiple years or different things like that. It's try to be the most realistic that I could possibly get to. 
and I want to know what you have to think about it. So two things. First off, leave your comments below. Tell me what you think about this card. If you think that it's better than the one that we are going to be getting at WrestleMania 34, then let me know that as well. If you had any problems with that, voice them in the comments. You know, I mean, I'm not fucking perfect and everything's subjective. So because everything is subjective, what would you do for WrestleMania 34? If you could go back in time to the night after WrestleMania 33 and you can rebook everything and rewrite how the history went down, what were your matches that you would end up putting on this card? Drop those in the comment section below as well. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and ring the bell on YouTube for notifications to uh, find out the next things that we're going to be doing here, which is going to be the hot tags, of course, and then the mailbag. So send in your mailbag questions as soon as you can so we can have a little bit of time that I can, you know, sort of set up everything and look at my questions and kind of get it all situated and stuff for next week. And um, follow us on Facebook and Twitter at SmartOutMoment. And keep checking smartoutmoment.com for all the other things that are coming your way from that site. Uh, Fanboys Anonymous is another thing. Check out that for the movie reviews and whatnot over on there. I think that's it. So thank you for indulging me in this, everybody. Uh, Let's see what your matchmaker type stuff is. And I will be chiming in on some of those too when I get a chance to. But that's it for me right now, everybody. I will talk to you next time. This has been another Smart Out Moment, and I'm being counted out.